specific optics, you know, um, very often some compacts can have very narrow fields of views and it, it's not necessarily that it's not made well, it's just sort of the nature of the beast. When you have a little tiny tube that's only about 20 millimeters wide, sometimes you can't bend ang you know, light at extreme angles to get really wide field of views compared to what you can get in something like these 32 millimeter models. And that's why um, the 32s have become so popular. They bridge the gap between a true compact, and actually I'll get the proper compact, do a just BD to BD here. Okay. So here's the, the compact up front in the BD line, the 20 millimeter, 25 millimeter, excuse me, 32 millimeter, and then our 42 millimeter. Basically, even though all the same power of magnification, you can see the difference in, when we talk about the millimeters, the diameter of this outer objective lens. The larger this lens, at the same power, the larger circle of light coming out the back side. You're probably not bright enough to see those circles of light here, it's a little on the dim side. So we get some backlighting, we can do that, there we go. You can see the, uh, what we call the exit pupil, these circles of light that are entering your eye. Um, as you reduce the size of the objective lens, you're reducing size and weight. However, um, you're also reducing the size of the circle of light entering your eye, all else being equal. So the reason that these 32s have become so popular, they approach the size and weight and portability of a true compact, but they still function uh, very much like uh, a full-size binocular and they have a very wide field of view. And the BD2XD, um, like I say, has a even more extreme wide field of view um, than others. So you can be out there uh, for scanning hours at a time, uh, it gets a lot of eye comfort compared to uh, something with a very narrow field of view. So that's one of the characters and one of the reasons you want um, a wider field of view is advantageous in the field. So for binocular wise, we've got the BDXD2 series, which is XD lenses, and we've got the Genesis, um, which is the next step. And um, that's actually got two, four lenses in total, hasn't it? Four ED lenses, two and two barrels. Right. Was the, uh, was now, when you do that, when you get more high quality glass, not only does your um, quality of the image that you're getting um, increase, but it, it generally means that you're dealing with a heavier binocular too, because um, the fact that the, the higher quality glass tends to be more molecularly dense um, and heavier per um, per lens. And this being a 44 millimeter, you've got two millimeters extra across here. Um, so the, the lens blanks are a tiny bit larger. It doesn't seem like a lot, but when you consider there's three different lens elements here in the objective lens cell, um, and then we have our focusing mechanism lens here. We get two prism blocks here and then five or six lens elements up here in the, uh, in the eyepiece where your magnification happens. Um, it can change a lot. So once again, if anyone has any questions, we're just kind of going off on tangents here, but feel free to ask any questions you may have specific to digiscoping, to our products, to any of the binoculars. We'll be happy to uh, go whichever direction you want. We're here. Yeah. Whilst we're on binoculars, what, what binocular is our closest focus? We, get, we are getting more and more inquiries about this, and I guess this is down to people in the gardens enjoying the mm -hmm. So. Um, and that would be the, the new BD2. Yeah, the BD2 um, is our closest focusing line. It's our widest field of view of all our lines. And not coincidentally, it's our newest line. You know, So um, that's become more and more of a trend in the optics industry. Uh, we rolled those out last fall after Bird Fair last fall, right in October, November, uh, the BD2 line. Um, but because of knowing what the industry is looking for, we rolled out binoculars with superior close focus. And again, uh, it's like 5.25 feet is what, probably 1.3, 1.4 meters on the? Uh, 1.3 on the 32s. On the 32s, and then the um, uh, the 42s are gonna be closer to five, five and a half feet, and I forget what that is now, 1.8 maybe? Yeah. Yep. I'm getting better, see? 
you were here, you'd smell the burning smell coming from me trying to do that in my head. But uh, yeah, but the 32s are absolutely, not only do they have the widest field of view of any binoculars on the six and a half, but the 32 uh, line or, or series as a whole, the 832, the six and a half by 32 and the 1032, close focus, like you said, to 1.3 meters, um, which is everyone can focus to their toes. You know, even, even if you're pretty, pretty sure you can, uh, you're going to be able to see um, and focus that closely uh, with the 32 millimeter BDs, which is re really nice. BD2 XD binoculars are latest line. No, I did notice on there too, Jeff, uh, somebody had asked a question regarding the light transmission values for the yeah. 632. And mm -hmm. I was just looking at some of the internal spec sheets that we have here. Um, you know, it's, it might be worth a little bit, just a slight uh, uh, turn as far as discussing those light transmission values and, and what that entails. Um, we don't publish ours um, in, in our uh, spec sheets for the most part. Uh, we do internally uh, testing against, uh, you know, competitors and what have you. But the problem is, is once again, it's just not a set uh, standard to use. So, um, um, you know, I worked in the past with several different um, optics uh, companies and, you know, they all have different um, specs and ratings. And it's uh, it, it becomes a number I, I find to be a little... Um, I don't right. know what's leading, but it's just, it adds some confusion to the process, you know, and um, uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys have any experience with that. Yourselves. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can uh, jump in on that one. Um, again, like you, I was with another optics company in the past, and a lot of times you'll see these transmission rates listed, and it's, you know, they don't really quantify what they're talking about. You'll see these 98, 99.7% transmission rate. When you see that, Generally, what they're talking about is just the transmission across the interface mirror on the prism, not through the entire system. Uh, more realistically, you know, a, a binocular is going to go from probably like 88 up to like 92% um, light transmission overall through the entire system. There is inherent light loss at every surface um, of every piece of glass throughout. I don't know what the internal spec is on the six and a half, but I can tell you it's a joy to use. Um, it's very bright. Um, and I don't find any issue, uh, as I said, it, at that price point, and I think that's the other thing you have to realize, obviously an 833 Genesis is going to deliver a lot more light than the 832 in the BD2 line. If, if we could do that the same, then these would be you know, close to a thousand quid probably, um, rather than where they are. See what I did there? Quid. Nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, I threw that in there just for you guys. See, I can learn, um, but anyway, um, so even in low light, though, these BD2s are phenomenal. And, and as I've said, in direct comparison uh, to the industry and other products in that price point, when we because we go to these bird shows all the time and we're all lined up, all the manufacturers side by side, um, before COVID, at least in January and February, before we got wiped out at, at every show, the BD2 was absolutely the most popular binocular um, uh, in that price point at every show, we outsold, outsold a lot. Yeah, and I think a lot of it too comes down to those price points. Uh, you know, when, when you get into a, a certain range of, of prices, say from a lower to a mid to an alpha type binocular, um, you're going to have similar light transmissions, you're going to have similar uh, spec, and it's just trying to uh, kind of separate yourself from the competitors because um, when you're in that alpha glass or even that mid price glass, you know, you're, you're only going to, you're all going to be within a certain range for that, for that matter. And then it's trying to improve on the ergonomics of it, improve on the field of views, improve on the close focuses and try to get, you know, value for the purchase. But, um, you know, the expectation of, you know, getting that type of super high light transmission in a hundred dollar optic compared to uh you know a genesis or a different alpha brand it's it's just not going to happen yeah one thing that code i always think do very nicely is so that the, when you look through their optics the the color's always natural isn't it it's, there's no there's not like a bluish coolish tint or anything like that and again you can see some really high figures for certain wavelength transmissions and it could be that 
an optic performs really well on a certain field and not in others. So um, I think you've just got to get pick them up and take a look through and, and just make your own mind up, really. Yeah. That's why bird fur is so great. <laughs> because there's, everybody's there. Yeah. All the optics are there, aren't they? And, you know, a lot and that's, um, that's a real unfortunate thing. It, you know, it's it's... Buying binoculars, we understand, is a very personal situation. There's a there's a very much of a fit feel um, type of aspect. Does it fit my hand well? Does it fit my eyes? Do I see well through it? And that's you know here in 2020, we've had to learn to reinvent the wheel a little bit, uh, which leads me to a, a question. And Rob, maybe I'm setting you up. I, mean, I don't know if you know the answer to this. Here in the U.S., um, a number of manufacturers have, uh, or not manufacturers, even retailers have. Uh, um, extended sort of no question asked return policies, things of that nature to try and combat that. So people can go and purchase their product um, without uh, fear of it's a, it's a final, you know, there's, there's great finality to it, especially since you do have to kind of test it out and feel, do you know, um, are, are similar things happening in the UK? You know? Not sure what the, how the dealers are combating this situation. I mean, um, the, all the, I know all the UK dealers are now open and fully okay. functional. And they're, they're encouraging visits. Obviously, everything's socially distant, and uh, you can make right. appointments and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure about. Sort of re I mean, it would make sense for you know web-based sales and things. It's, sure. uh, it's um, yeah, very hard, isn't it, to make a decision? You know. Uh -huh. you well, know. you're in a different situation than that. Most of your dealers are open, then you're. Yeah. Yeah, ahead of us there. So that's that's one good thing. But that's another consideration you could always ask uh, if you can't get to a dealer. But obviously, it's um, uh, that's something worth talking about. Scott, uh, you made both Paul and I smirk at the same time with your question. He asked, "Is there anything to the in the field rumor of a camera binocular combination from Koa?" I can say without doubt that is a nasty, vicious rumor. The closest we've got to that is going to be that right there. <laughs> it's all you need, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, slap your your uh, uh, your phone on the back side of your binocular. But um, no, that's not in the works. You know, uh, Koa was uh, revolutionary back in the day of the, oh boy, now I forgot what it's called. The, the very first phone scope, the TD one, was it? What? Yeah, TD, some, uh, it was uh, quite, like a gray, Quite an angular looking piece of equipment. Yeah. yeah, back in 1991, they were the first ones to try the integrated uh, spotting scope um, camera combination. It was a bit ahead of its time, I think. Um, it didn't, I don't think it even came to marketplace. They were showing uh, prototypes around when I'd first started in the industry, got to see it, touch it, uh, smell it, but then it disappeared. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a really tough situation. Um, to do one of these integrated systems and in candidly i think it would be a it's neat but um with the almost planned it's not planned but it is you know um expected obsolescence uh and the rapid changing of the sensors of the electronics um it's almost easier i think to find better ways to couple the two rather than to provide that all-in-one solution because now you're having to buy an optic at a at a higher price and then obviously uh, to get really good results you're going to want to get that alpha price highest priced product for the best results naturally um that's going to become obsolete in in a year you know or as, as soon as you year. buy anything you know combining digital on the the optics you're just buying something with old it's going to have old technology on it you you just keep you know it's, it's bad enough trying to keep up with the smartphone which are kind of giving up for at the moment and just yeah. Wait until you know the the next sort of, the next camera advancement, which I think the eleven. You, are you on the eleven Pro for your digiscoping? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean yeah, that was a leap. Pro Max. That was a leap. That was wasn't it? That that phone. Was, was yeah, fun. and it really did uh, kind of change the the game um, as far as that's concerned. Um, you know the, and I might as well talk about it since I've got it here. Yeah, it kind of goes right into a question that we actually just yeah. received. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you saw that one? So, yeah. into the, 
So the thing about the 11 Pro Max in particular, and, and hopefully you can see that, it's got these three lenses. And most of the, the newer um, camera models, no matter what you've got, like a big thumbprint on the wide angle lens, there you go, um, do have these multi-lens setups, right? So on the 11 Pro, uh, which I'm using up here, you've got the top lens, which is a 28 millimeter lens, okay? Uh, which is pretty standard. That's most of the prior iPhone models at least had that 28 millimeter lens as a standard because it allows you to shoot at a somewhat of a wide angle when you first put it up there. Um, but from a digiscoping standpoint, you're going to show a lot of vignetting when you first um, mount, um, mount the phone to the spotting scope because of the fact that that 28 mil lens is seeing wider um, than the scope allows basically. So you'd have to run the zoom up to eliminate some of that vignetting. Now, um, the third lens here, this little lens is a super wide angle on the 11, not really um, valuable or usable for digiscoping at all. But the bottom lens on the other hand is a totally different situation. Uh, this is um, the 2X lens on there. And the 2X lenses have really, what a powerful tool for digiscoping they've become. With a 2X lens, now you're at about a 56 mil um, lens. And when I mount the 2X behind the eyepiece, I have zero vignetting uh, right, out, right out the door. Um, and I can, even at, at the lowest power of zoom on the eyepiece, um, I've got no vignetting whatsoever. And that allows me twice the magnification I had, but still the faster shutter speeds and a better ability to stop motion uh, based on the fact that I've got uh, a lens that's twice as powerful. Uh, da, 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 da. What did I do with it? There he is. There he is. So when I'm out in the field, digiscoping, and I've got my spotting scope set up on something, I can mount this here. Now you'll notice that I am using a phone scope adapter um, rather than a COA branded adapter. And that's because of the fact that as of yet, um, we haven't developed an adapter that really accommodates both lenses. Uh, so I went this route because it does allow me to switch that 2X lens and utilize it more effectively. So that's part of the issue there. Um, but it is a powerful tool. Uh, it does allow you to do great things. The other thing about it is, of course, with every successive generation, the resolution gets better and better and better. And one of the things that maybe I can show um, if we have time is actually the ability to shoot video um, and grab stills um, out of the video that are super high resolution. It's something that the new uh, Micro Four Thirds uh, mirrorless cameras are doing as well, shooting in burst, basically a video mode. You guys want to see that now? Want me to switch that quickly or? Do it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. And, and while, you're, while you're getting that set up too, just to go to David's question about, um, you know, are we seeing more DSLR or Four Thirds or? phones, it's definitely trending to the, the phones and it has been for the last several years. You know, it's, a, it's an item that's always on your person. And so um, with the simplicity of just having that uh, phone adapter with you, um, if you do have several other products, whether it be a Genesis binocular or even a smaller 55 scope, then all you're doing is actually changing the diameter of the ring. And, um, you know, it just, uh, provides you the ability to not have to go out in the field with so much equipment. Yeah. Bird fair is always a good gauge, I find, of, of how the, the trends are going because, you know, you would get uh, a few years back, it, you'd be discussing about compact cameras and that kind of thing, and then it moved on to DSLR, and now it's predominantly smartphone. I mean, there, there are your, 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 um, your real high-end digiscopers because they want so much control over um, shutter speeds and camera settings. Uh, some of our work our ambassadors do they, they whilst they use phones that's more for sort of um, just enjoyment and fun where if they're going out they'll shoot with their um, mirrorless cameras and because and, and they, they want ultimate control but for, for the majority of us and for me I mean I've been digi digiscoping for oh, many years uh, when I first met with Paul Hackett one of our UK digiscopers and but now unless I'm doing product testing and things it's it's always the phone it's just so much fun. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm the uh, the rebel, and uh, I just refuse to go camera, and I'm utilizing the phone. And and if you look here, this is literally 
if you remember in the old days or, you know, say three years ago, old days, five years ago, um, if, uh, grabbing a, a uh, uh, you know, a still out of a video usually meant a real fuzzy, not crisp image. This is a video I shot of a black whiskered vireo that showed up in my yard and I was, um, long story short, it uh, is a bird that does occur in Florida where I live, but um, not where I live. It was the first summer record and it's very long build and it has characteristics that look like the subspecies of race we wouldn't expect here in Florida, but perhaps of the nominate race more typical in the Caribbean. And while I'm trying to catch pictures to show in particular the bill length, um, I had a tough time because the birds are constantly, when they're foraging, they're looking around all the time. So you just had to get that split second shot um, of getting just the view you want. But here, what I can do literally is I can just go through these, these screenshots until I get what I want. Oh, let's go back a little bit. Um, say there showing the bill length, although it's a little soft. That one's crisp, but it's a little at an angle. Um, you know, you have the ability to really move back and forth on these things, find just the, the image you might want that looks sharp. I can eliminate this and literally um, go to my uh, Windows print screen for collect a screenshot of that and then crop out the black after the fact and, and get just exactly what I want. Um, so let's see if I can pull up the screen share as well while I'm doing that to, to give you an idea. But it's it's changed the game a great deal and it's because of the increased resolution. So if you're into digiscoping, you've tried it in the past, you know, you can get the best spotting scope, um, but you know, the that technology comparatively changes at a snail's pace, you know, the mechanical side of it, but the electronics are changing every single year. So by upgrading your phone and or your camera on your kit, you're gonna find that you're having much better results even with the same scope you had. Um, so. If you're doing 4K, you pull a still out. I mean, that's, that's yeah, this is pixel image, isn't it? So, I mean, you can do a lot with that. You really can, I mean, we, we've printed them off. Um, up to a three size and they're holding the pixels together which yeah you just think when we get 8k you'll be into 32 million pixel still images so every frame will be a super high res image it's it's frightening really isn't it but good <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing um yeah the, the, david david just asked one last question about tripods and it was what kind of tripod i mean i guess we all agree on a, a fluid video head for your, for your digiscoping, yeah, what I tend to use just something that can, as soon as you put a camera on the end of a scope, you will, you'll know if your tripod head uh, <laughs> is going to, you know, make the uh, make it enjoyable or not. And it's worth investing in um, a reasonable head to to, yep. to get that nice fluid motion because um, it can it can spoil the whole experience, can't it? Especially with digiscoping. I mean, you're talking. At least a thousand millimeter focal length, and then some. So um, yeah, I would always, I would always invest in a, a good tripod head. Yeah, our friend Rob Fletcher adds that uh, the new game changer is the 8K video on the Canon R5, and pulling a still image from that. You know, um, currently experimenting with it in the software, and that's that's exactly right. You know, that seems to be everybody's favorite new toy in, in the world of digiscoping is the ability to shoot little video clips um, and, and capture that exact moment, that precise, you know, behavior you wanted, you know, if a bird's singing with the bill wide open and, and just grab that frame, uh, which is something you didn't used to be able to do. So that's, that's become really fun. Um, yeah, and even, and even with those cameras too, it's not like it, it's burden, it's a burden to, uh, to shoot with your DSLR, we don't want to, to take it away. If you've got nope. great equipment already, please use it. I mean, you're talking, you just need a, a PA7 and a, you know the applicable uh, step ring and you're good to go with your camera as well, so. You know, you'll always have um, the, the, the camera purists that, um, you know, they love all those settings and the menus and things. I know, I mean, the, I don't tend to dabble with the uh, some of the apps on the smartphones, but even some of the smartphone camera apps are giving you so much flexibility 
when, when you're when you're phone scoping, Jeff, do you just use the Apple um, inbuilt app for you, when you're doing your uh, phone? Oh so, yeah, that's uh, when you're utilizing the two X lens. Um, it can be a little tricky um, because the onboard um, software does want to kind of outthink you and think what you want and, and select the lens it feels would be better at a situation. So you, um, if you run up your, your digital zoom at all and things of that nature, it can switch lenses on you. And sometimes even when you are predicting it to do that. Um, so there are third party apps, um, you know, phone scope makes one that's free, but not as many um, controls as some of the others like uh, the camera plus app and others that will allow you to manually select, this is the lens I want, don't switch from it. Um, in a pinch, um, on, on the iPhone 11 Pro Max, that portrait mode generally will default almost invariably uh, to the 2X lens. So as a quick fix, you know, because it's a little more um, intuitive, sometimes I will just hit the, uh, uh, the quick, select for the the camera and just pop portrait on it stick it on there um and shoot on the portrait mode um behind the scope as well i'm getting great results with that so yeah very very happy i mean it's shooting the best scope and presently the best phone so you know obviously the images are stellar whilst we're, whilst we're still talking about phone scoping, there was there was one question about um exposure with the smartphone and um yeah, there's. I can't talk from a from an Android phone, but certainly in the in the iPhone app when I'm digiscoping, I'll always hold my finger on the screen and lock the exposure and lock the focus, and then I, so I've got full control because you you do get camera hunt, don't you? The the focus hunt when you're trying to focus the scope. Man, on video. Yeah. Um, so always hold your finger down on the screen until you get that AEAF lock. And then you can control the exposure yourself by just simply sliding your finger up and down. So if the image is looking too bright, just drag down the exposure and then just fine tune your focus on your scope. It's, and that, that will, it's a game changer in terms of phone scope, you know, I always find. As soon as you lock that down, then you're in control. I think I have a lovely animation for that. Is that the same one that you can find on that we have baked into the uh, YouTube channel? The, yeah. The scoping video there. Yeah, that's a great resource for people just starting off with that to make mm -hmm. sure they can visit that and uh, got a lot of tips and tricks. Indeed. Yeah. That's uh, go to youtube.com uh, backslash user backslash Koa sporting optics. And uh, we've got over like 120 now, I think, uh, videos um, that occur there, uh, that we've got a handful of them on different types of digiscoping, one on phone scoping specific. Um, but yeah, you can um, absolutely check those out. I have got that animation on my... Um... Are you getting it? I'm just looking for it as well here. See who gets it first. <laughs> I'll, I'll share, my, uh, share my screen. Ah, you got it. Okay, beat me. Um, is that coming up as uh, full screen? Yep. yep. Uh, no, not full screen. We've got the, uh, not yet, has it started yet? But yes, it's. So yeah, so so um, if, you, if you press your finger and hold the screen when you're, in, when you're, when you're looking through the scope of the, the phone, and you'll, this is with iPhone, and I'm guessing it's similar with the, the Galaxy models and other models. But, um, you will see a little um, yellow square flash up that says AEAF lock. Um, you only have to hold your finger for, it's about a second, I would say. Um, and what that does is it brings up this, um, this exposure control, which is just a simple dial. And touch screen up and down will um, alter the exposure. So obviously up will brighten your image, down will darken it. So, Especially if, you, if you're photographing something like an oyster catcher or something which is black and white, um, very often the phone will, and if it's on a if it's on a particular background which is dark or light, the phone's going to try and expose the the most sort of even shot. And the trouble is with that, you the white feathers 
could very well just be a, a blob of white and we want to try and avoid that. So it, it is worth locking that, locking the phone down and you, you make the decisions. And then yeah. once you do that, you can use the scope to do the focusing. Yep. Yep. So, uh, and that's really important to when you get, uh, you know, well, there you go. Just exactly what I was going to talk about right there. When you get that branch in front of you and the autofocus picks up on it, you can lock the screen and with it locked, it's now locked in focus. It's not going to hunt um, and, and search the autofocus anymore. Uh, your exposure is locked. That's auto exposure, autofocus, what the AEAF is. Um, and then you can just twist the dial back and forth to get the subject in focus uh, rather than, um, you know, the branch or the leaf in the foreground. Um, and that's a real big tool. I, if you learn to do that, the other thing too, if you're shooting video at all, you definitely want to try and um, lock the screen first. That's a sort of a, sometimes you forget that and you've got this gorgeous video going and all of a sudden you'll see it start to hunt back and forth and you'll, it'll go in and out of focus and, uh, can really detract from the quality of your, your video. So it's better to try and, um, lock that focus and then and as you need small um, tweaks on the focus you can do it using our fine focus control on the uh, on the Koa Promenar spotting scopes that front dial. Um, What's this um, the slides up we may as well just briefly just because if, you, if you're if you're new to if you're still learning and just and trying things out when you first um, put the um, push the, the, the adapter on um, something called the eye relief it's quite important where you position uh, the actual, this is positioning the lens of the camera with the eyepiece. If you've got this quite strong blurred vignette in here, the, the sweet, you haven't found the sweet spot, you're looking for a crisp circle. So just by adjusting the eye relief and then pushing the adapter back on, once you see this crisp circle, you know that you've got it in that sweet spot then. It just takes it only takes a few seconds to just to get used to what the, the optimum position and yep. then you're away and it's it's the same with your eye you can test it with your eye with a binocular even um i wear glasses most most all the time so i have the um, eye cups twisted down to use behind my glasses however if i had those down and took the glasses off and mash those right into my face i'd see that same blurry circle and and sort of these blackened shadowed arcs, these crescent moon shaped shadowed arcs um, in, my, in my field. And it's just telling me that the lens in my eye is too close to the lens in the binocular. And it's the exact same thing you see when you're digiscoping. If you get the two lenses too close together, um, you're gonna find you get those smudgy blurry spots and you just have to separate them. Um, as Rob just showed, you can pop up that eye cup on the scope uh, to give you more distance because the ring will make sure that you're centered side to side, top to bottom, but not three-dimensionally back and forth. And there is going to be a, an ideal spot there as well for the eye relief. Um, but for vignetting, if, you, if you're using the, the, uh, the color adapters, because they use the standard wide angle lens, you'll inevitably get uh, vignetting. So because the, um, our eyepieces and the scopes are so good, rather than digital zoom, to, to keep that image quality, always use the optical zoom of your spotting scope. So um, that's an example at uh, the widest angle, 25 times on the, on the spotting scope. If you twist your optical zoom off, most times you'll almost eliminate the vignette. And it depends, varies on the smartphone models and eyepieces and what scope you're using. But uh, very, but you'll get this. You may get a, a, a nudge of um, vignette in a full optical zoom. You can either nudge past that with a little tiny bit of digital zoom just on the screen, or just crop it out. Uh, it depends what you want to do with the with the end image. If it's just a, a record shot, then it's no mm. big deal. If you want to do something more creative with it, then uh, yeah, just, just always remember crank up the zoom because the scopes are good enough to do that. I mean, all, every every smartphone image I've ever done is at 60 times zoom. Yeah. And yeah. the quality is there. Agreed. Yeah. This one's more about alignment. Again, with the push on with the push on rings, just just if you're getting um a, a shot an image like this on your phone where the alignment not right, it's it just taking a bit more time just to make sure that your your adapter is totally flush and and, and straight on. As soon as you've got that crisp circle, 
your own business and you can start them. Mm -hmm. well, that's the end of that short sequence. Let's come back to uh, come back to you guys. Yeah. Hey Jeff, there was that. Uh, there was a question real quick that was asked. Yep. You had any recommendations as far as apps to use while shooting? Did you see that one on the Q and A? Yeah, uh, and I think it's that uh, the Camera Plus is is the one that I think is most popular right now. And there's a small fee for that. Um, you know, here in the U.S., it's two or three dollars. You know, so maybe you know maybe a couple pound. Um, but it it offers a lot of um, control over the uh, the manual um, um, aspects of the camera, including which lens to use, um, you know, a lot of uh, manual override capabilities for the person who wants to get a little more um, uh, intense with it. If you want to keep it simple though, the onboard stuff will work fine. And what you have to do is just, with any system, with any digiscoping system, you just have to realize um, how far can you push things before things fall apart, you know? And once you realize where the limits are that you need to work within um, with that system, then you can go about, um, these are the, my best bets for getting my best images, you know, uh, with this particular kit. And, and when we're giving these live digiscoping webinars or, or even um, moreover, you know, we even would do like a, an extended, you know, day of digiscoping. Uh, that's one of the first thing I always do is I, I kind of help everyone go through their kit um, to realize what limitations they have. So they have realistic expectations and then we can push right up to that expectation, but not beyond. And then that's, uh, that's sort of the, the thing with digiscoping. None of these pieces were ever meant to work together. It's just a fluke that it does. And um, we as optics manufacturers have to do our best to find the best methods to couple all these things together. And COA has the most complete line of adapters to accommodate every aspect of digiscoping you might want to pursue. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, and I would, I'd also keep in mind too that even if you have a competitive uh, brand that a lot of our rings will fit for those too. And there are, um, uh, Rob can steer you in the right direction as far as those reference sheets, but um, it's not solely, uh, you know, our rings aren't solely uh, proprietary to our products. Yeah, I think, you know, between us now with um, Coa as a, as a whole, we've got probably a, a huge range of options, haven't we, for, yeah. for our own stuff and for, um, yeah, other models. Because, um, you know, I think we've got the biggest support for smartphone models going as, as, a, as a premium optics brand. Um, yeah. For sure, um, not including universals. And I'd like to talk, you know, that brings to mind another point. Um, very often, a universals are, I mean, obviously, from a, uh, the standpoint of a, of a dealer, it's much easier to have one single unit that's a universal. And while the universals can work quite well, um, just by virtue of the beast, it's, it's a piece that's designed to work on many different phones and many different eyepieces. And you have to think to yourself, this means that I have to do a lot more adjustment. The more adjustment you have to do, unfortunately, the more opportunity there are for errors um, and, and including repeatability. And unfortunately, when we're digiscoping wildlife in particular, or birds, you know, that are, you know, here now and gone in two seconds, um, having something that's mated specifically to um, you know, the phone you're using um, and the eyepiece you're using. So there's no guesswork. I can just slap that on there and the lens is centered um, and it's going to friction fit, stay on my eyepiece, which, you know, uh, the co-adapters do that very well. Um, it's, it's a big bonus. Um, you're going to take away a lot of the guesswork, the, a lot of the uh, necessity to have to fiddle and, and refine the center and you know as you're doing that the bird flies away and uh you're you're stuck you're out of business so yeah that's um kind of the magic uh if you're fine you've tried digiscoping you've got a universal, universal adapter and or an older um camera that you're trying to couple generally speaking switching the adapter to something that's mated um and newer electronic technology generally is going to make you a lot happier <laughs> in the long run. You're going to find that you are more easily getting very good results um, with a lot less 
um, trial and error. And that's, that's what you're shooting for, right? You know, you want this to be an enjoyable experience. So, um, we could even have them. with all with our system with the smartphone system. If if you've got another brand of optic and you've invested in the rings to fit certain eyepieces, we even do a an adapter plate that will go into our it reduces our own um, the, the adapter ring on our own adapter. So if you've invested, you want to invest in a new smartphone, but you've got your you've got your better scope eyepiece, you've got the ring. You can look at our KM30 plates and. Um, put that into our adapter and it, you'd have to check the, obviously check all the data on the website, but it could be that you could be using your ring from your scope on our adapter. So we're, we're, we're trying to be as helpful and as flexible as possible really with this. Uh, that's one thing with code, the, the, the system, it's so cross compatible. It's just, if you want a digiscope with a camera, with a phone, you can use the same adapter. So many options that, you know, we could do a, a five hour webinar just going through, you know, what's possible. We? We've threatened to do that, haven't we? We still yeah. probably should do that one. Yeah, and most and most of the components too, you know, using the the system, you know, they're going to be compatible with scopes up to forty years old. So you know, don't think that you have to have the latest and greatest. If you got some Koa gear, you know, there's compatible eyepieces and digiscoping components and everything available for you. Someone say we did that. The bird fair the last two years actually we had a little uh, a corner up there for the system s for the, for the older models and pe people were bringing in their tsm ones and we were setting them up with the smartphones and there we go yes yeah That's my original <laughs> tsn4 and actually we talk about uh the this is still the original old 20 by 60 eyepiece on there right a2 yeah. <laughs> that's the tsm1 there yeah, but um, you know the other thing that we've got is we we've got this now. So if you we, Koa sold a lot of these. This is long before I was with Koa, but I made the decision as a as a professional birder, a guide at that point, a guiding in in Alaska and other places, and working professionally as a birder. This was the finest scope on the marketplace by far. Um, so you know I invested in it. Still have it, still working. But you know we there's a ton of these out there because a lot of people did the same. These old eyepieces, however, we're talking about uh, wide field of view and other things we were talking about, it is compared to the new stuff, it's like looking through a drinking straw. And there's not near as much um, of the, um, uh, what do I want to say, not only do you have a much lesser field of view, but um, um, you also are get, not getting the light delivery that you are with the modern eyepieces. So I'll talk about the 9Z and the universal aspect there um, you can actually upgrade your old body by getting uh, one of the new um, te 9z eyepieces and they'll fit on the, on these old tsn one two three four um, and so you can actually bring new life breathe new life into uh, the older spotting scopes and then of course you've got a full suite of modern adapters that uh, fit that eyepiece as well for digiscoping so that's been a popular fix for a lot of folks it's amazing how uh, how many people come to to the shows and they're like this, like yours, Jeff. They're, 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 the scopes that they're often immaculate. So why would they want to? You know, they don't want to upgrade the scope. They, they, this scope's been with them all over the world or whatever. And uh, yeah, you know, you mine's know. not immaculate. I did not take good care of it. I was I was very abusive, but how, how don't take it. Was that? Don't take it. How long have you had that scope? Then did you say? I got it in 1990. And I used it in some of the harshest environments day in and day out, like out on the Aleutian Islands, um, you know, in the uh, uh, in the Bering Sea with, you know, 80, 90 mile per hour winds um, on a regular basis, you know, sandblasting the, the, <laughs> the outer lens elements and dropped it in the rocks, dropped it down cliffs. It was uh, Alaska's a rugged environment. Um, and that's where I was doing most of my work, but it's still still there, still chugging along. Send it in for service. I'll give you a good deal. Yeah, you know people. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. guys, any other questions that we got? Anyone? Uh, obviously, you can reach out to us at any time. Um, and Rob, what would be the best uh, for the folks that are UK based, at least, uh, to to reach out um, for for assistance? 
Yeah, I mean, our, our um, help desk email is scope at coaoptimed.com. Or if you go onto coaoptimed.com, uh, yeah, all the contact details are on there. But yeah, check, check out the Bird Fair page, coaoptimed.com forward slash Bird Fair hyphen 2020. We've tried to put some interesting content on that we've been doing over the last few months with uh, the COVID, all the webinars and things. So it's a little taste. I guess of, of the, some of the things that you can do at Bird Fair. So, um, and also we'll post. We're going to be just chatting with some of our um, uh, UK and uh, Europe-based um, digiscoping ambassadors over the next couple of days as well. So we'll post some content of just just asking them what kit they're using and you know getting a feel for what kind of uh, techniques they use. So um, yeah, we'll we'll post some 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 nice content over the next few days just to keep the bird fair spirit going. Yeah, I wish we could be there for sure. And then just like one other um, opportunity to, to call out those uh, nice little kits you guys put together over there. So the 500 series scopes and the eight by 25 SV. And then uh, the secondary option is the 66 scope with a case and the eyepiece of course uh, with a BD2. Uh, yeah, those are nice. I'm gonna have to do something similar at some point. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the sort of you know the, the I mean like the, the compact kit with the six sixty. I mean that is that's a serious. You, you would not want for anything with that kit, would you? you? That would last you a lifetime. You could take it anywhere. And like I say, the, you know the the ultra compact kits are really sort of uh, inclusive for everybody to enjoy and use. You know, so um, right. And again, here's the other kit with the six sixty and the in the BD. Um, yeah, you know I tend to think. You say that, that that would last a lifetime for someone, but then, you know, invariably it seems like um, birding's kind of a renewable resource and, and you, you find that person that's got an 88, you know, and you keep looking through the 880 over time, but for sure, that's going to treat you very well. Um, but there's always room for that advancement to the next level. And I find that that's a pretty common situation that we birders tend to do uh, as a whole. I know I did. I started off with a pair of hand-me-downs out of my, um, that my grandfather had from 60 years or were an old poro prism up in my attic that had things growing in it, you know, <laughs> you know, snails crawling through it and stuff. Um, then I bought a little $50, you know, pair from the, the drugstore and moved up to a $300 pair. And, and then, you know, I got to a point where I was very serious and was going to work professionally. And I got the highest level um, premium gear, you know, the, uh, the alpha binocular uh, and the alpha scope and, you know, um, you know, so I had that uh, COA scope for guiding. Um, but yeah, you know, there is there is advancement even beyond the 66, but certainly uh, that's a really nice piece of kit that's going to treat you very well. Is it a question has just dropped in about the focusing on the scopes. But we, 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 if you watch this webinar back, we did explain that the, the push and pull relationship between the focusing on the phone and focusing on the scope. Mm -hmm. um, we did. It, we we have covered that in this webinar. Uh, there is a very simple fix to it. So um, yeah. We'll well, quickly, we can go back to that. Uh, generally, if you lock the focus on the phone, override the focus, especially on our Promenar models, where you have this dual focus system. This is a fine focus and a coarse focus back here. Um, when you couple the extra magnification of a camera or phone onto the massive magnification of the spotting scope, that fine focus becomes your, your best friend um, to be able to tweak the focus. And I do that all the time. I'll lock my focus, double check the focus, and even sometimes manipulate the focus here before firing off the, the shutter release. So. Go on, to the, on the YouTube channel, there's loads of hints and tips and on, on the social media, we're always, we're always posting. Jeff, you, you're very active with your phone. You're always out and about, aren't you? Posting the, um, the all sorts from Saturn this this month. Yeah, yeah. Shooting at 830 some odd million miles away. So it's, uh, it's effective near or far. <laughs> Did you just go? I'm just going to this um, this very nice T-shirt that one of my colleagues in the US sent to me. Um, co hashtag Coescoping. So if you're out with your kit. Digiscoping, tag, it, tag us in with the COA scoping, or one word, and uh, it could very well appear on our wall of fame. 
So who could knows? Might... Lead to who knows? A special prize could arrive. You don't know. Right, you just you never know, know what could happen. No, you might even end up with a T-shirt. Yeah. What is this? So if we're it got... sent to Canada or something first. We, we, yeah, we've got <laughs> hundreds of images now have been submitted. It's uh, it, it's it's great. Yeah. It's moving really nice. Keep, keep keep the Koa community going. Lots of like-minded people sharing their physioscoping images. So perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, Rob, I appreciate you having us on, and appreciate everybody Thank you very much. Well, yeah. and listened in, and uh, like Rob said, you could go to um, coaoptic.com for any. Uh, to submit any questions on the U.S. side, you can go to customer service at coa.com and we'll be able to answer anything. If it's something that me and Jeff can't answer, we send it to Rob anyway. So it's yeah. kind of this uh, little uh, circle, yeah. circle like, of knowledge. Actually, it's probably a line of knowledge between you two and I just kind of uh, send stuff along and learn a little bit on the way. Enough to be dangerous. Yeah, at least, at least we've got our little bird fair fix. Like you know, it's a shame we could because the nice thing about bird fair is that everyone shares their ideas as well. It's not, you know, the the team, it's a chance for all the team to get together. We're very lucky often that the some of the optical engineers from Japan come and visit, and um, it, it's yeah. No, it's it's truly one of the probably my favorite event to attend, and just the community and the people. It's it's really awesome, and. Um, I'm bummed out that we missed it this year and hopefully we'll be able to come back, you know, twice as strong next year and uh, everybody will be able to catch up and uh, get back to uh, normal. And for the record, I will say that uh, the view here does not compare to that of the optics marquee. I saw no red kites. I, if I unrolled my window, I probably could have seen an osprey here in Florida. They're dirt common here, but uh, comparatively, but um, yeah. That's it's not the one I'm looking for when I go there since they're in my yard daily. But uh, yeah, you know, Robin's Kingfisher. <laughs> At any rate, we're just babbling. Yeah, All thanks, right. Guys, for uh, coming on. And, uh, Great pleasure. Hope that we can do it in person next time and, and chat with all the folks, um, you know, in the optics marquee directly in 2021. Got our fingers crossed. Oh, I got, I'm typing a quick question for somebody. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we know people. Yeah. Has anyone had any, anything about the iPhone 12 expected release? Yeah, well, I'm watching that closely because I want one. Yeah. So, uh, you probably need one for your job, Rob. I'm pretty yeah. sure. It's it's time. It's time. I, I haven't I haven't upgraded for a, for a while. So. Uh, yeah. It just gets painful after a while. It's like, I'm not going to pay that price. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then they just get so good. You're like, oh, man. I'm not yeah. sitting on that small, the iPhone SE, which is a nice little small phone. I, I wish, I just wish they would do something with the spec of the, you know, the 11 in a smaller phone because um, I'm just not a big fan of massive phones, but still. Uh, we'll see. But yeah. Well, it's it's imminent. It's always around October, isn't it? The, the Apple. Yeah. Yeah. It's yes. on its way for sure. All right, you guys. Thanks All again. Right, Good seeing you. All right, Take care, everybody out there, and um, you know, keep checking in. We're doing webinars frequently. Do you got anything coming up? I mean, outside, I know Bird Fair. You've got the ones with uh, 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 Paul and Simon, but is there anything on your side, Jeff? You got planned on the webinar front. You mean? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, there's a ton planned. Um, I don't have anything scheduled. No. Um, we've got uh, threats to do things um, with a, a number of our conservation partners. Um, we're trying to put together um, a, a next level virtual bird walk, um, which we're going to be featuring soon. Um, you know, using our what we like to call our coalition of ambassadors. See what I did there, coalition. <laughs> Thank you, Be Here All Week. But at any rate, yeah. Um, keep an eye out uh, on the Facebook page and we will have continuing content coming at you uh, on the webinar front, but um, we'll see who's ready to uh, to step up and speak next. I mean, I, Rob and I are always here, but uh, it's like we'll be here all week, but we, we 
prefer to try and get in, uh, um, obviously, the, the guest speakers where we can to, to give a little more um, different flavor, if you will, uh, to, our, to our webinar series. So we're working on some biggies coming.